Okay, so let me say a few words about the exam um, and also about the review session. I'll start with the review session. So tonight, giving a review session at 7 o'clock, and that will be in ALS 4001. Okay? ALS 4001. Everybody got that? Okay? 7 o'clock. Uh, I will videotape it, and uh, you don't have to be there. If you want to be there and ask questions, I'll be there answering questions, etc. All right. Um, for the exam day, what I'd like to do is spread you out, okay? So when you come here, the, the sooner you get settled in the way I'm going to tell you, the sooner we can get started with the exam. I generally let the exam go for only 50 minutes because sometimes people have to leave and I want to give everybody equal amounts of time. So 50 minutes, I'm going to cut you off on the exam, all right? So here's what we're going to do. When you come in, I want you to position yourselves such that you're in every odd-numbered chair. Number one for this one, we'll start here. So number one. Then I want you in number three, and then I want you in number five, okay? Over here, we'll start with number one, number three, number five. Count in the individual row that you're in, okay? So if somebody's sitting in two, don't jump over to four. Sit in three, and I'll make the number two move, okay? But seriously, because it, 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 with a big class, it really makes it easier for me if you position yourselves appropriately uh, in those chairs. So one, three, five, seven, etc. And then over here, we'll start one, three, five, et cetera, okay? And if we have to sit adjacent to each other, then I'll ask you to sit in the front to do that. So if you need to sit one, two, three, four, five, because all the uh, every other seat is taken, then we'll start doing those up front, okay? That's, that's uh, if, and the sooner you get doing that, the better. We'll be better off with that. Okay, uh, so that is the sort of things for the exam. Any questions about the exam or the format of the exam before I get started in lecture day? Has everybody looked at the format of the exam? If you have not looked, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, that is not a multiple choice. That's why I want you to look at that exam. That exam is basically a set of true false questions. So one, you see one A, B, C, D. You might see one of those true, you might see two of those true, you might see three of those true, you might see all four of those true. So you should be circling anything that you see as true. Okay? So you get credit for every one you correctly do as true and every one you correctly do as false. So instead of putting a little T and F beside it, you're just making a little circle of the thing. Okay? Yep. 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 No, no. So you get credit for the number of ones you mark correctly true and the number of ones you correctly mark as false. So if A were the only true and B, C, D were false and you marked A and C, it's in the instructions, but if you did that, you would get credit for A, you would get credit for B because you didn't mark it because it was false, you would get credit for D because it's false and you didn't mark it, but you wouldn't get credit for C because you marked it wrong. Make sense? Okay. Read the instructions. That's why I want you to look at those practice exams that are there. The format of your exam is going to be exactly the same as that practice exam. Everybody done that? So those are not multiple choice questions. They are true false questions. Okay. If you have questions about that, come see me. I'll be happy to try to explain it to you. Okay. So the format is the same. I hope time will not be a factor. Um, what happens on this exam, it tends to be a little bit more of a factor because people aren't real confident and fast in doing calculations. So I try to keep it, I try to take that into consideration in writing the exam, but sometimes it just, this tends to be one that's a little bit short on time. Okay? Don't spend too much time on any problem. And whenever you have a question on the problem, raise your hand. Please don't come down and see me. I don't want you climbing over everybody, everybody to get down here. I want you to stay where you are, raise your hand, and I will come and answer your question, which means I get good exercise during the day. Okay? Make sense? All right, so check the practice exam. Make sure you understand the instructions on the practice exam because that's going to be exactly the format that you've got, and it's important to do that. The other thing, piece of advice I'll give you is the more you organize and label your work, the more we're able to give you extra credit. And the more we see scribbles, unorganized, unlabeled things, the more likely you are to get virtually no credit. Okay? So it's important that things be labeled, organized, etc. If you decide something didn't work, then scratch it out. We don't mind that. You don't have to erase, scratch it out, that's fine. But make sure we know we can follow your line of logic 
in what you're doing and your labels. Because without that, a number is just a number. And that doesn't tell us anything. Okay? Other comments or questions? Yeah. Am I strict on spelling? Basically, um, I, you've got to be pretty darn close. So I think college students should be able to spell. Since grade schoolers know how to spell, I think college students should know how to spell too. Okay? Yeah. You will not need a calculator. You, you, I will allow you to have a simple calculator here if that makes you feel good. Not scientific. Okay? Uh, but a simple calculator, that you're, you're welcome to have that there if you want to have it there. I don't have a problem with it. Um, but all you have to do is set it up. Those of you who have come to see me in my office have been surprised. That's all we got to do? Yep. All you got to do is lay out what you would put into the calculator. You don't have to do the punching. Okay? Get in the habit of that. And then you, because that's what's important, is setting up the calculations, showing me how you got into that point. That's what I care about. That's what you want to do and, and be able to do, because I trust you can punch it into a calculator. Okay? So you will not need a calculator. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, practice, practice them, I think, if I recall correctly, is even a little bit long, just because I put a bunch of problems on there for people to work. Uh, so I think the actual, I've, I've mostly written the actual exam, and as I recall, it's a little bit shorter than what that one is. Yeah. I don't like time being a factor. I don't like you having to race. I can't promise in every case that it's going to work for everybody, but, but I, I do take it into consideration. I try not to make the exam too long. Okay? All right. So let's finish up um, the um, control of enzymes. And we'll move on to talking about membranes. Membranes are essential for biological uh, organisms. Well, last time um, I went through and I talked about the mechanism by which serine protease is acted. And one of the things that I hope you remember from that uh, uh, description was that a serine protease works by creating this alkoxide ion. And the alkoxide ion was that hydroxyl group on serine that got its proton removed by histidine. That left behind a negatively charged, very reactive oxygen, and that very reactive oxygen attacked the peptide bond that's in the active site. Everybody remember that? So that alkoxide ion was the key to understanding how the peptide, how a protease works, a serine protease works. If you understand that, then what I'm going to show you right now is going to make perfect sense for you, I think, I hope, okay? And that is, I'm going to show you a related kind of protease that uses a very similar kind of a mechanism. It's called a cysteine protease. And a cysteine protease works by not having a serine residue with an OH, instead it has a cysteine residue with an SH. Here is our friend, histidine, and histidine is involved in taking off a proton off of that sulfur to create a sulfur ion that is very reactive. And that sulfur ion attacks the peptide bond, and we break the peptide bond, we make a covalent intermediate just like we did before, only now the intermediate is stuck to the sulfur instead of being stuck to the oxygen. We have a fast step. We have a slow step. Everything like we saw before in the serine protease is happening in the cysteine protease. So this common mechanism is occurring in both cases. Does that make sense? It's Friday, isn't it? Nothing makes sense on Friday. Okay. All right. So that um, is, as I said, a very common mechanism that we see in proteases and cysteine proteases work almost identically to serine proteases. The last thing I want to just briefly mention are something that you, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, you have the catalytic triad in the serine proteases. And the question is, does the cysteine proteases have the catalytic triad? They only have histidine and cysteine. So they only have the two. They don't have the aspartic acid as well. Good question, though. Yeah. But again, the most important thing in both cases is the histidine is pulling off that proton and creating that negatively charged or um, reactive uh, atom. In, in, in the case of cysteine proteases, that atom is a sulfur. In the case of serine proteases, that atom is an oxygen. 
Okay? All right. Now, um, I want to just say a brief word about coenzymes. Coenzymes uh, really aren't relative to control. So they're kind of misplaced here, but your book had decided they had to put coenzymes somewhere. So they put them in the section labeled uh, control. What's a coenzyme? I'm going to define that term for you first so you have a better understanding of what they are. A coenzyme is a molecule that helps an enzyme to catalyze a reaction. It's a molecule that helps an enzyme to catalyze a reaction. Now, that means that these molecules that are there are not amino acids because the amino acids are already part of the protein. This is something separate from the amino acids of the protein. So these coenzymes help the protein to catalyze a reaction. Many of these, in fact, every one that you see on here is a vitamin. Vitamins are not uncommonly coenzymes, meaning that their function is to help an enzyme to catalyze a reaction. All right. Now, I'm going to point out a couple of the more important ones that we'll talk about uh, this term. And any of the ones I talk about, I think, are fair game. The first of these is biotin. Biotin is a very important coenzyme. It's a coenzyme that we see helping to catalyze reactions that involve the addition of carboxyl groups to things. So when you see carboxyl groups getting put onto something, biotin is almost always involved. Okay? Biotin is almost always involved in enzymes that put carboxyl groups onto things. We'll see why that's important later when we talk about metabolism. Okay? Flavin coenzymes. Flavin coenzymes are involved in what's called oxidation and reduction. You've heard of oxidation. You've heard of reduction in your organic chemistry classes. Oxidation reactions are those that lose electrons. Reduction reactions are those that gain electrons. So they're involved in oxidation and reduction. <coughs> oxidation reactions lose electrons. Reduction reactions gain electrons. The most common flavin enzyme that we will talk about in class is called FAD. FAD. Our related set of enzymes are called the nicotinamide adenine coenzymes. And you'll probably think of them as NAD. NAD. And they're also involved in oxidation and reduction reactions, characterized by being niacin. That's a, uh, a vitamin. And for our purposes right now, those are the only ones we're going to be concerned about now. We'll talk about the other ones later. OK, so you see that coenzymes frequently are vitamins. So begin to see a nutritional link to some of the things we're talking about in biochemistry. Here's the structure of NAD. And no, you don't have to know the structure of it. All right. NAD has basically uh, two um, uh, nucleotides put together. Here's adenine, which is uh, a, a nucleotide we find in DNA and RNA. And here's a nicotinamide, which is a related compound that looks very much like adenine. And they're joined together. You don't need to worry about that. I'm just showing this for your own information. Nothing on here that you're going to need to regurgitate for me. OK. Um, we're not going to talk about that. OK, that's what I want to say about coenzymes. Are there questions on that? OK, then let's move on to membranes. Yeah, question. So, uh, the question was, is, will a coenzyme be involved in speeding up a reaction or just helping to get, an enzyme, get a reaction started? In most cases, it will be essential for the reaction to occur, period. Without the coenzyme, the reaction will not occur. Okay. 